it's good to be with you again. As Jeff indicated, I am very excited about what we will study. And I feel really good for those of you who have stayed the course with us because we are dealing with some very difficult passages and sometimes people get discouraged when they get difficulty in understanding certain texts and things seem a little puzzling um, for them to understand. But you have remained faithful and you have continued to, to stay with us as we try to understand God's word and get some enlightenment on it. And I really appreciate the effort that you have made to make yourself available for Bible study because it is very, very important. It's, it's one of the pillars um, that we must perhaps establish within the church, it's prayer, and it's the study of the word. And we have to make sure that these foundational things are things that will continue in the life and the ministry of the ch church because they're very, very relevant and very important. Before we go into the study, I just want to take this opportunity to give some appreciation to a person who I refer to as my study buddy. For a number of years, over a generation, we grew up as young men together studying the word and partnering together as we encourage and motivate each other. We share information and we you know, did research into things that might be difficult to understand. I'm speaking of the person of Brother Delvin McAllister from the Spike Zone Congregation. We have had a long history of, of sharing and discussing the word together. And there was a little break in our, our transmission, but we have resumed connection again. And during the course of this study, we have been very much engaged in, in sharing relevant research and information that we discover challenging each other. We don't always disagree, I always agree, I should say. I think we, we agree on maybe close to 95 or more percent of the time. So the few areas where we might have a little disagreement, that doesn't affect you know, our relationship and our connection. And, and there's no animosity in, in the things that we disagree on. But we have heard, shared very good fellowship together. I really appreciate um, Brother Delvin as a sort of study partner. He has not been to Bible Seminary, but he's very, very knowledgeable in the Word. I appreciate the challenges that he gives in terms of engaging me in discussion and examining critically um, things from the Bible and sometimes our own opinions and the way we see things and, and looking for research and to get truth and to understand the Word. And it's very good have individuals that can engage like that. So I want to give Brother Devin a shout out. I let him know you appreciate him being there, um, you know, to keep me challenged and engaged. And as we study the word together and learn more about God's word, we are able to share and help enlighten others that are part of the church family. So I just want to get that in before we proceed. Now, last week I gave you an assignment, I hope that you have taken the assignment seriously and you have done your research because we have been looking at a very difficult passage. As a matter of fact, this study has caused us to be engaged in some very difficult scriptures, scriptures that have um, caused a lot of debate and discussion and, and variations of opinions and interpretations and understanding, even among the scholarly. Um, uh, people who have been, been trained in the study of the word. We have had a whole lot of ways in which there are differences in interpretation and understanding. So we recognize that that is, is a fact of, of the study of the word, especially when we're dealing with apocalyptic literature or we're dealing with um, prophecy, because a lot of that language is symbolic and it lends itself to a lot of interpretation. And so we have had a, a number of, of difficult passages which have engaged us. And tonight we are going to be looking at another one in Revelation 20, which is another difficult passage. But I think we have gotten through um, Matthew chapter 24 with its corresponding passages, Luke 21 and Mark 13. 
that's one of the difficult passages. Then we look at the Revelation 13 with the beast and the mark of the beast. And we look at 17 with the apostate woman. And we look at Revelation 12, trying to understand who the woman represented in, in that chapter. So those were some pretty heavy um, study areas. And we try to engage our, our understanding of, of different opinions and different interpretations because we, we have to be open to different opinions and interpretation as long as we are dealing with symbolic language because it's not always clear cut and well defined and it's very necessary and important that we, we check other references in the New Testament and the Old Testament where we have difficult passages that we have to try to get resolved and understand. Then we tackled another difficult one last week where we were looking at Daniel chapter 9 because there has been a lot of dialogue and discussion in relation to that particular passage in the Bible as well. And usually the interpretations tend to be connected very much to the particular school of theology that, you know, we might tend to, to follow. But whether you're premillennialist, amillennialist, or postmillennialist, very often our interpretation is very much connected to which of those particular schools of theology we tend to support. That's why there are some individuals who say they would rather remain um, disconnected from either defend with a particular camp because they, they are open to, to studying the word without um, any attempt to try to defend a particular position because often that can happen rather than being open um, to, to the word and, and approaching it with an open mind very often what happens is that when you associate with a particular um, school of thought or theology or a particular perspective you tend to read um, in, a, in a way of trying to defend the particular position which you are hold and very often we can, we can miss some very important truths that we need to understand because we tend at times to superimpose a particular view on the scripture based on our background. So I want to remind you again that even, even though we are predominantly supporters of the amillennial position, we are not really looking at the word to defend amillennialism. What we are, we are doing is trying to understand um, our particular views and interpretation, and, and we will find that they're, they tend to lean more towards that particular view. But it's not that we are defending that, but it's to get an understanding of where um, the Church of God, Reformation movements, theology really um, lies. And as we examine other uh, views from the scripture, we get an understanding of whether or not we are sound in our interpretation or if we might need to make adjustments based on what is revealed to us. So it's not a matter of defending a position, but it's, it's to be looking for the truth and understand what the word of God says to us. And I must agree that in the final analysis, most of our particular positions tend to line up with that school of, of, of thought, um, which is often referred to as amillennialist. And we get a, a little understanding tonight that's the way we, we also need to, to adjust that particular definition because it gives the impression when we say that we are a millennialist, that we are saying that there is no millennium or that we do not believe in a millennium. So that will have to be clarified um, a little better as we examine Revelation 20 because most of the positions tend to be connected to their understanding and interpretation of that particular chapter. Now, I had asked you to check um, your research to see if you can identify some specific things which we were trying to understand in relation um, to Daniel chapter 9. Because we were looking at Daniel chapter 9 to get an understanding of the timing of the kingdom. Remember that our last course of study that we were examining, we were looking at the kingdom of God and try to understand what the Bible teaches about the character of the kingdom and the timing of the kingdom. Because there's variation in, in understanding and interpretation of things related to the kingdom. And these are things that have led to significant debate and disagreement 
um, among theologians. And so we need to get a clear understanding of, of what the word is, is teaching. So I, I told you that you could go back over it because it's a very difficult passage to understand if you don't you know, get the full details of it. And I said I will give you an opportunity before we look at Revelation chapter 20 to ask any questions that you may have to clarify any misunderstandings or if you have discovered any research that you think might help to clarify or enlighten us on certain things related to, to Daniel um, chapter 9, you can share those things. I also give you a assignment to check to see if you can come up with a, 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 a time period. You may not be exact, but you could be close in relation to the birth of, of Jesus. And while you're on that, I, I should throw in another question here for you to answer, if you can answer tonight, how many wise men were there that went looking for Jesus? The reason why I am I'm throwing these little things in is because I want you to see how easy it is for us sometimes to follow an established tradition and, and base our, our theology or our doctrine understanding based on, on traditional views and positions, which might not necessarily be accurate when you examine the word closely. So I, I put these things in to, to, to give you a little chance to see for yourself how, how it is easy to find ourselves squeezed into a, a mold that tradition has established and then we sometimes miss what is the doctrinal truth because we do not examine as closely as we ought to what the word is saying. And so I think tradition can, can cause that to happen. That I mentioned before, our understanding of Christ's crucifixion in relation to the day before the Sabbath. Traditionally, we have established the thought pattern that it was the day before the seventh day Sabbath. But when you examine the word, you can get a different understanding based on what the scriptures reveal. So there are things connected to the birth of Christ, connected to the wise men, connected to things um, associated with the advent. That, that fit into a traditional mold and sometimes we base our doctrine on understanding of that. So I just put those things in there for you to check to see how you know you might be fitting into a particular traditional understanding as distinct from looking precisely at what the word of God might say or not say that you get a clear position as to what the understanding should be rather than what the tradition has established. So that's why I put those in. And I want to engage you so that we can talk, we can share, we can dialogue, and we can clarify some of the things that sometimes they have a misunderstanding based on, on tradition. Right. So I want to engage you so that, I, again, I won't have to, to do all the, the talking or, or explaining things to you, whether I would want you to be able to share with me, tell me how you see things, how you view things, perhaps how Daniel 9 came over to you, what your understanding of it is. Um, some things you might have a little difficulty in understanding or some things that you might want to interject that could you know, put a different thought pattern in our minds and that we could re-examine some of the things that we might have been inclined to think or to interpret based on Daniel chapter nine. After you shared, I will get the opportunity to recap any things that might have been given a little difficulty to make sure that they are very clear and, and, and that we can move forward then with a good understanding of, of where we are. Last week, we looked at a number of scriptural references from the New Testament which spoke of the kingdom of God. And I believe, if you have anything to question, you can question, but I believe that, that it was made clear from those passages that we can establish the reality of, of the kingdom of God being a present um, experience. And that while we are looking for the consummation of, of the, the um, eternal kingdom, we recognize that we are actually part of a real kingdom governed by Christ. We being the subjects have laws that we follow and Christ is reigning spiritually in, in our lives. I believe that we can conclude that. But of course, if you have any difference and variation from that, you can let your opinion um, be known. As I, as I indicated before, don't, don't let your thinking be shaped by what I, I, I project. 
right? You have the right to challenge anything I say, disagree with anything I say, have a different perspective or interpretation. And I want you to feel free to share that because that's how we learn. And remember, that's what the Bereans did when Paul presented his theology. They checked the scriptures to see that it matched up with what the original um, doctrinal position would have been. And that there was no variation from the foundational things that were established um, by the apostles. So that's what we do when we study the word. Always check the foundation. Check to see that there's no um, variance that is moving us away from what the, the word uh, wants to establish in our hearts. So you can also um, give any expressions or ask any questions in relation to those New Testament passages which we looked at. I gave you some to research from the Old Testament, which I told you we would we would tend to um, give more thought on the, and discussion to when we look at the Millennial Kingdom. And you can feel free also to express any views you may have in relation to those. And we're going to add a few more passages to the, to the list as we examine um, Revelation chapter 20 tonight. So I open for a little while. For any questions you may have, any statements you may want to make, or any answers to those questions that we were asking about was Jesus born in AD or BC, and what could be the possible um, birth period for Jesus? Um, we thought about the wise men and when they came, and about the timing of, of their coming and what that was connected to. I tried to give you a little understanding last week. But of course, if you have discovered any new information, you can share that with us. So I'm open at this point. So you talk to me and give me some feedback. Yeah, yes, Rev. Uh, we have uh, either a comment, a question, or query from um, Reverend Sandiford, Reverend Stephen, and, and Lady Marguerite, Sister Sandiford. So you can all mute and go ahead, yeah? Okay, good evening. Good, good evening. evening. Good evening um, to you. This is from Stephen. He sub submits the 4 BC. He submits the 4, 4 BC for... 4, 4 BC for, for the date that he was, yeah, was born, yes. All right, okay. All right, thank you very much for that, Brother Stephen. 4 BC. All right, that's Stephen's position. Yeah, the, 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 the general thinking from scholarship is between 6 and 4 BC as it relates to, to the birth of Christ. And, and it is linked to, well, arriving at that date is based on when Jesus would have started his ministry, etc., etc., and, and the duration of it and, and things like that is how okay. they... All right, so, so so we are establishing then from the comments we have made so far, unless any other persons vary, is that then Jesus was born in B.C. and not A.D. Correct. <laughs> right, right. Because, because that was one of the first things we were trying to figure out. Because we were inclined to think that because the time dispensation was adjusted to, um, to Jesus' coming, and we moved from B.C. to A.D., that you start reckoning the time of Jesus from, from AD. And, and that could have been a misunderstanding, which would have caused people to arrive at, at different time periods in relation to the, the life and ministry of, of, of Jesus. All right, so that, that is, is clear then, that Jesus was born in BC. But then after we, we, we got to 1 BC, remember we said the change over now is from 1 BC to 1 AD. And that's when the dispensation changed and we we're using now in the year of our Lord rather than before Christ because there's no zero. So you move from 1 BC to 1 AD. All right, so we have around 4 BC. Any other thoughts on that? Because there are differences of opinion in relation to the timing and we can sort of get a, a close approximation. You see, it is difficult to get exact dates 
Because remember that we also change calendars. We had the Babylonian calendar, which had 360 days in the year, which the Jews also had 360 days in the year. And we'll check back the timing from Genesis and even in Revelation. You see that the, the number indicates that we're using 360 days in a month. But then you change over the, to the Gregorian calendar, which we are operating on. We have 365 and a quarter days in a year. So whenever you are, you are checking back times, you have, you have to accommodate the adjustment that has been made in the changing of calendars. And that's why sometimes it is difficult to get an exact timing, but you can get a close approximation. And that's what we're, we're trying to understand. All right, any other opinions on the on the on the date? Reverend Jackman. Yes. yes. Um yes. Stephen, Stephen bases his on around the death of Herod. Right. He he bases his around the death of Herod. Death of Herod. All right. All right. And I, I when we get the discussion, I, I will, will add a little to that. All right. Death of Herod. So it is difficult, it's gonna be difficult to sense for him. And we have to be smart in the thing that first. All right. Any other comments on the on the timing for Jesus' birth, so that we can we can proceed? Because I, I don't want to you know to delay too much by waiting for responses. So I'll give another minute or two if there are no more responses to the, the timing of Jesus' birth. We can have a little discussion and then we can move on to some of the other things that you'll be checking. The number of wise men I asked that. I suppose if if we will be true to scripture, um, the Bible does not say <laughs> the number of wise men. Um, I think what probably would have influenced the thinking, the gifts. Because you have gold, frankincense, and myrrh, and then uh, the, the the song that we sing, "We Three Kings of Orient Are," but, yes. but the scripture does not say how many many there were. Just Maggie from the east, as as some versions would say, you know. Right. All right, Jeb. Very, 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 very thoughtful there, and and that's correct. The scripture does not say how many wise men there were. So we need to understand that. Matthew says, wise men came from the east seeking Jesus. But there was no numerical um, account in terms of how many wise men. But as, as you indicated, which I was trying to point out to you, tradition established because of the gifts. They said they brought gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And so the assumption was there were three wise men because they would, the assumption would be that one had gold, one had myrrh, and one hand fighting saints, but 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 there was no um, indication as to how many wise men there were. And as you rightfully said, the sound based on that we three kings of Or because the tradition established that there were three. So even some of the carols that were written were given the impression that there were three um wise men. But again, that is, is not what the scripture states, but that is a tradition um which has, has been established because of the particular way um, that was perceived. So there could have been six wise men. There could have been nine wise men. There's one tradition from the from the, the, the Syria um, version of the Bible, which indicated that there could have been 12 wise men, but, but they're, they are basing that based on, on the, 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 the comparison of, with Jesus having uh, selected 12 disciples, and they are saying that that, that could have been a link to indicate that the possibility of it could have been. But you, you can't establish a doctrine based on the number because the Bible does not indicate a number. It's the tradition that was um, arrived at because of the gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh, we concluded from the scripture that there were three. But you're right, Brother Jefferson, there's, there's no particular indication as, as to how many there were. But that goes to show you then how a tradition can be established based on how um, an interpretation is made and that has become a long-standing tradition and everybody thought about the three wise men. All right, I want to comment on, on, the, on the date because there's nobody else um, wanting to join in on that. 
by the Stephen indicated 4 BC. And yes, 4 BC is the date identified for the death of Herod. But, re but remember that Jesus was born during the time of Herod. So he was born before Herod died. And, and also what you have to draw on is that when the wise men did come and Herod tried to get information from the wise men, his conclusion was, and again, the Bible does not say how old Jesus was at the time, but his conclusion was based on the information that he got from the wise men that Jesus could have been about two years old. No, he could have been three. But he concluded from that information, which he, he took from the wise men, if you read the, the scripture um, carefully, you will see that, that Herod sort of interviewed the, the wise men because he was trying to find out where the Messiah was born. And, and even his scribes and, and his um, his persons that were were researching indicated that he would have been born in Bethlehem. Looking back at what the prophets would have said, they, if you check Matthew chapter two, um, that would be an indication. So 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 Herod assumed that Jesus would have been about two years old, and that's why he ordered that babies two years and down will be killed. So from that. The conclusion was that Jesus could have been about two years old. So if he was about two years old and Herod died in 4 BC, means that Jesus would have, have to be older than four um, years old because he would have been born before Herod died. And so the indication is, um, for, for, for many people, is that Jesus could have, been, could have been born around 6 BC. Some even project to 7 in case it's a possibility that Jesus could have been a little older than two years old, but that Herod might have um, misunderstood the information given by, by the um, wise men and, and calculated that. So you have to add that in. So that's why a, a, a lot of theologians tend to think that Jesus could have been born around 6 BC. Now, another traditional thing that we, we have come up with as well, which I, I started to explain last week, is that and you, you often see it in plays and in dramas, um, and even in songs, that the wise men were in the major with the shepherds. And so when you watch plays or you watch movies dealing with the nativity, you see the wise men with their gifts you see the shepherds and the baby and everybody in the stall. But again, when you look back at Matthew chapter 22, Matthew, Matthew chapter 2, sorry, it says, and the star came and stood over the house where Jesus was. So Jesus was now in a house. When the wise men got there, he was not in a manger. But that is, that is a, a, again, another tradition that has come along based on, on a misunderstanding and a misrepresentation. And we tend to put the wise men with the shepherds. No, they came afterwards. And they came when Jesus was in the house. And that's why we said they refers to the child. So he, he would have been approximately um, two years old. Another connection that we made that was significant is that the wise men came um, to coincide with what they perceived would have been the birth of a king. They said they saw the star, which indicated that something significant was happening. But remember, we also said that the, the vision which Gabriel interpreted for Daniel talked about the coming of the Messiah. And we said that the, the, the wise men were from Persia. And, and Persia is the place where Daniel was when, when he got that um, interpretation from the angel. And remember, he was made the head of the wise men. So we, we are drawing conclusions. Again, the, the Bible is not specifically saying these things, but we are making conclusions based on information. So it, they came from the east, which was in Persia. Daniel was in Persia when he had the revelation from, from the angel. And chances are the wise men could have gotten that information about the coming of the Messiah and the timing. And remember, there was a time reference given 
there, there is variation about the time reference. And, and I, I said last week when we were discussing Daniel chapter 20, um, Daniel chapter 9, that we will not go into the, the timing because it will take us too much time to dialogue about the different decrees. Because we have had people identifying the, the timeline starting from what the what Angel Gabriel said. That from the going forth of the decree to rebuild Jerusalem and the city, you shall count 483 years and the Messiah shall come and he shall be cut off. We said what is significant about, about that um, revelation in Daniel is that you're getting a prophecy of the coming of the Messiah. You're getting a timeline for the coming of the Messiah. But because people have different dates of starting the timeline, they end up with different um, interpretations in relation to when, when it was referring to the life of Christ. So some people start from the Cyrus decree. Some people start from the art of the Xerxes decree in Ezra. And some people go to the second decree, um, which was given uh, to Nehemiah. And, and therefore, you get variations in where you start from. But that's why I told you to read Isaiah, because Isaiah 43 indicated that Cyrus was the one who was going to give this decree to rebuild Jerusalem. So if, if Isaiah prophesied that Cyrus was the one who was going to give the decree, my conclusion is that we should start from the Cyrus decree because that's what Isaiah prophesied. And if we go to the Artaxerxes decree, we might be, be then going to a, a decree which was not prophesied by Isaiah, and then you will, you will make Isaiah prophecy null and void. And a prophecy given by these men was very accurate. And so that's where I would be inclined to start the date. But most um, theologians and, and interpreters start from the Artaxerxes decree and they arrive at the entry of, Jeru of Jesus into Jerusalem. That is when he was about to be crucified. Or some people start from the baptism of Jesus by John. That's when he was beginning his ministry. And if you read Luke chapter 3, it is Luke is the only person who gave at least at the age um, timing in relation to Jesus. He said he was about 30 years old when he was baptized by John. Some people look at that as, as the, the, the significance of the coming of Messiah, meaning to, to start his ministry. But what is important to note is that the wise men, in their interpretation, calculated the timing to coincide with the birth of Jesus. So that's another significant point that we, we need to bring into the whole understanding as to what the timeline would, would seem to indicate. But they say, don't let's get our heads tied up over that because the, the most significant things are identified in, in, in the interpretation given by Gabriel. And I mentioned some of those to you, which I will recap, but I will, I will pause again to see if you have any questions in relation to that, to, to, to Daniel and to the things that we discuss. These are some, some important points that we need to understand. There is a timeline and the timeline is connected to some aspect of the Messiah. For some people, it's his entry into Jerusalem. For some people, it's his baptism. And for some, it could be connected to his birth. But you must have the calculations correct to be able to specifically say, this is what it is connected to. And the calculations has to be based on calendar adjustment. It also has to be based on when the decree was given. But it, it, it is a fact that the angel said, count from the time the decree is given to rebuild the wall, add 483 years to that, and you'll get the coming of the Messiah. The question is, what does that coming mean? Is his coming, coming to Jerusalem to announce that he's, he's king and, and, and to establish himself as the one who is going to be offered as a sacrifice for our sin and for the atonement of the people that he had come to make atonement for? Or... Is the date going to bring us at the baptism of John where people say that this was the announcement from, from heaven. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And that represented the anointing of the Messiah that 
the gear that the age of Gabriel would have told um, Daniel that the Messiah will be anointed, he will be cut off, and so these are the timelines that people associate um, with what Gabriel is saying. But you're going to get variation because people make different calculations and, and, and the adjustments sometimes don't bring us to an exact position. But as I said, it is important and it's interesting to note that the wise men who would have been in Persia, who would have either been told directly by Daniel or they would have read the information that was recorded about this timeline. They did their studies, they did their research and they came looking for Jesus in the place where he was born at the timing of his birth. He was about, as I said, about two years old when they arrived. But the reality is they came based on a birth connection and not on a baptism connection or not on a triumphant entry into Jerusalem connection or not any time associated with the adult um, life of Jesus. So I'm saying that that is important to consider when you're looking at the timeline. But we're not, we're not going to, uh, to stress ourselves over being accurate about that. What we do know is that Daniel, um, 500 plus years before, um, was given the revelation from Angel Gabriel that the Messiah was going to come. Now remember, I pointed out to you what was also significant is that Gabriel was the one who visited Zechariah and announced to, Elizabeth, um, to, to Zechariah that he was going to have the forerunner of Jesus. And then Gabriel also came to Mary at the appointed time and made the announcement of, 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 of her going to be um, pregnant with, with the Messiah. So that was very interesting in terms of the time that Gabriel went to Daniel. And he also was the one who made the appearance to Zechariah. And, and, to, and to Mary. All right. So any queries about any of the information that we would have discovered from Daniel chapter nine? I'll pause and if not, we can move on then to look at uh, Revelation 20 because that will engage us pretty deeply. So we don't want to you know, waste time. So I will just give you a minute or two. If you have any queries, or any statements on relation in relation to Daniel chapter 9. I'll just recap just a few of the main points and then we proceed. Give me a nice hug. Okay, so we're going to, we're going to proceed. I'm hearing a little voice in the background, so somebody might need to mute their phone. Well, I'll see say your friends. Okay, so in Daniel chapter 9, we established that a, a time reference was, was given as to the coming of the Messiah and the purpose of that coming. Gabriel identified a number of specific things which were connected to, to the Jews and to the holy city. And what was significant is that he mentioned there was a period that they would have been given to get restitution for their sin and to get a period of, of pardon for all their transgressions, which would have been the result of the, the need for the punishment which they received. And we said that Daniel would have read Jeremiah chapter 25. And chapter 29, you can see the references there, referring to the 70 years that they were in exile in, in Babylon. And there was punishment because they disobeyed the, the, the law which God has established of allowing the land to rest during the, the, the seven year period. And they would have disobeyed that law for a number of years. And now they were getting the equivalent of the punishment multiplied by being kept and taken in, into Babylon. And at the time, when the time was drawing close, Daniel made a very, very important intercessory prayer, confessing his sin and the sin of the people 
and asking for really an, an atonement and asking that God would bring in um, his period of blessing that he would have promised um, to the children of Israel. And Gabriel assured him that the time was not yet and that they had 490 years, 77 or 70 um, heads as, as the word is, is, is used. How we use the word dozen, they, they use sevens. And we indicated that it was seven weeks of years. Because if it was just 70 weeks, all the things that the angel had prophesied could not have been accomplished in those 70 weeks. Because, again, that would be, be just um, a, a relatively short period of time. So to accomplish the rebuilding of the, the city and the walls, which took over 49 years or approximately 49 years, and then for the Messiah to come, you would obviously have had a, a wrong time period because Daniel had indicated that the Messiah would come during the Roman Empire. And the, and the Medes and the Persians were still in power at that time when Daniel had the revelation. So if it was only dealing with 70 actual weeks, then it means that the Messiah would have come during the reign of the Persian Empire. But now we had the Greek Empire to come and then we had the Roman Empire to come, so obviously the timeline definitely has to refer to years and not just weeks. There are weeks of years. So the 70 weeks multiplied by seven in terms of years give you 490 years. We did indicate that the 490 years were given for the completion of all of those things listed in Daniel. We're not going to go back through them, but it gave a period for the Jews to, to, to come to a place where they acknowledge their, their transgression and be reconciled to, 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 to God's purpose and will for their lives. And, and that is important to us. So that before judgment comes, God always gives us a time for, for restitution. God always gives us a time for repentance. And that was a long period of, of transition that the Jews would have had to make reconciliation. And these are the things that would have been established by Christ to bring everlasting righteousness and and to see that division and all those things which we indicated would have been fulfilled in the, in the life and ministry of Christ. But the Jews, again, failed to come to the position. And we, we mean the Jews as a nation. Because remember, I indicated that there was always a remnant of Jews which kept the commandments, which were faithful in their obedience to, to God's laws. There was always that remnant. But as a nation uh, and a large mass, many of the Jews were rebellious. And God had given them that time to finish the rebellion. So this is important to us. We are now in a period of grace. And there's going to come a time of judgment for this world. And we must make sure that we take advantage of, of the time period that we have given. We are given this period of grace to, to bring an end to our rebellion and disobedience and our separation from God. And allow Christ to, to establish his reign and rule in our hearts because there's a time of judgment coming. And we should not make the mistake like the Jews and allow that time of restitution to pass and then judgment comes. And remember that part of the prophecy indicated that judgment will come on the city of Jerusalem. And Jesus did prophesy that as we read in Matthew chapter 24 and it came to pass in AD 70. And there is a school of thought, not, not many um, would, have, would have made this proclamation, but it's an interesting thought that has been coming forth um, in discussion that the possibility is that that 70 years could have also been included in the, in, the, in the whole time period that would have been allocated if you start from the Jeremiah 70 years and go and go right through to the years that the angel would have made mention of that would have brought you right down to that punishment that which the Jews received where the temple was destroyed and we had now a change of, of, of covenant where God now established his covenant purposes with the, the, the Gentile nation. Well, of course, the Jews are, are part of that too because Jews would have been part of the of the, the new covenant promise as well. But now the Jews are not now God's established people for bringing in everlasting righteousness. That has now been transferred to, to the, the Gentiles in the new covenant. And as Peter points out, so we are now the, the priests of God to show forth the praises of him who have called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. So all of those things are connected to what the, the revelation 
that was given in Daniel 9, and, and we see the importance of that connection. As I said, what it solidifies is that the word of God is true, and that, and that prophecy um, is fulfilled, and this gives um, credence to the word of God, and the fact that it's reliable, it's trustworthy, and we can depend on it, and it definitely reveals the fact that it, it is the, the word of God, and that he is the author of those things that are prophesied in his word. All right, Revelation chapter 20. I told you to read it. And I'm going to give you an opportunity, if you have read it, to give me an indication of thoughts that come to your mind, questions that you think we need to get answered. If you don't understand Revelation 20, remember, it, it's still connected to the whole thought pattern of the kingdom of God. That's the theme that we are on. The kingdom of God, we look at the timeline coming from Daniel, but we look at some prophecies that were made um, in, the, in the Old Testament related to the kingdom as well. And we're going to see how they're connected to, to what Revelation 20 is interpreted as from the premillennial view, because they do not see the kingdom of God as yet established. Because like the Jews, they are looking for a physical reign. Christ on a throne, reigning on earth and governing people from off the throne of David in Jerusalem in a period which will come after the, the tribulation is over and Christ returns for the second time to establish his kingdom. That, that's the theological perspective of the premillennialists. And I dare say it's the, it's the view of the majority of the evangelical churches. And I think the Adventists as well um, also hold to that um, actual physical thousand year millennial reign on earth where Christ comes back and set up a literal physical kingdom and reign from Jerusalem. Now, why we need to examine that is because it occurs in a passage of scripture which comes in apocalyptic literature, which means that it is in one of the most symbolic books in the Bible, first of all. And then the passage itself in which it is recorded has a lot of symbolic language. But before I go into it in any detail, I, I just want to engage you. If you would have read it before or if you would have read it when I had indicated last week that you should get a chance to read it through and anything that is puzzling to you, any questions that you think would need to be answered as we examine that passage or, or difficulties that you, you think might, might need to be explained, I will give you an opportunity um, to dialogue with me now before we actually go into it. Because we have to, like the other difficult passages, go into it in very detailed analysis so we get a clear understanding of how it, it should be interpreted that we get a revelation of what um, the, 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 the writer intends or I should say the revelator because the revelation is coming from Jesus to John John is just described so we have to understand what is Jesus really trying to show us from Revelation 20 all right, so I pause for a, a minute or two to see if there are any things that provided difficulty for you when you were reading it or some questions that have arisen in your mind, things that you, you think we need to, to look at carefully or things that might need some explanation. All right, don't get shy on me now. You you were you were very very vocal over the last two three sessions, and you were engaging in dialogue. So don't get nervous now, because we are coming out of another difficult passage. Be, be free to express your thoughts. So, Rev, we have um, either comment, query, or question coming from uh, Brother Ian, Brother Ian Innes. So, yes, Brother, Brother Ian. Yes, Brother Ian. 
Hi, good evening, Reverend Jackman. Uh, I wanted to ask you, um, how does Revelation 20, mm -hmm. uh, how, how does that fit in with the witnesses and their theology as how they come and teach when they come around? How does that fit in with their line of doctrine, if you have any comment on that? I, I haven't heard their, their particular view in relation to the to the millennium as a, a specific thousand year period, but I know what part of the theology indicates is that only a certain set of people are going to go to heaven, which means that, and I think that's what they, they, they how they interpret the 144,000, and the rest of the people have to remain on earth and actually live down here. So I do not know if they phase the thousand year period into that. Um, as a, as, a, as a continuum, or if they see these, these specific um, period of a thousand years as to be lived out before you go into the, the final um, eternal consummation where you receive your rewards and your ascendance, and some people will get access to, to heaven while the, the others will have to remain on the, on the earth. I will have to check that to see what is your specific view in relation to the millennium at a specific period in which takes place in time before the, the actual end or the consummation of all things come. Yeah, because I have I have often wondered um, what determine or who determines this 144,000 for them? What, what is the criteria? This has always been my question for them um, in terms of that doctrine. Right, but ag again, what, what you have to be careful of is is not literalizing numbers in the book of Revelation because a lot of the numbers, a lot of the the, the language, a, a lot of the illustrations that are used are very much symbolic. You talk about a sword coming out of, the, of a person's mouth. You talk about spirits like frogs. You talk about the beast. You talk about the dragon. You talk about a, a whole lot of of symbolism, even in the numbers. Because when you talk about the 144,000, you, you also go on to realize that then there was a number that no man can, 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 can number and, and, and can count. And then you had another number, um, 10,000 times 10,000. So, uh, so a lot of the, of the language in Revelation, even when it comes to numbers, we have got to be careful that we do not literalize um, on things and, and come up with an interpretation which could misrepresent what the intent of, of the word um, really is. So we are not doing a study of the book of Revelation. That, that, that's the, the, um, the sad part because then we will get a holistic understanding because you remember a, a, a whole story is being told in Revelation, a whole drama is being unfolded in the life of the church. And, and to, to get the full picture, it would be, it'd be good if we could have studied the whole of Revelation because what we are doing is looking at specific aspects of the drama and trying to interpret what they mean. Just like the Bible, the Bible gives a whole story from creation right down to when Christ returns. And sometimes what happens is that we pick up little aspects of that drama, of that story, of that narrative, and we don't connect it to the whole, and, and, and then we get a misunderstanding and a misrepresentation. That's why it's always good to understand the whole. I think this is, is, is where the premillennialists make a lot of mistakes in interpretation. They, 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 they miss the whole picture and, and I think some schools of, 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 of thought and, and some you know, dominations in, in their interpretations very often miss the whole picture they miss the symbolism they miss the typology and we miss the shadows and don't see the, the light or, or I should say we miss the light because we look on the, on the shadows and there are a lot of things in the, in the Old Testament that were shadows where you got the greater light in the New Testament. Remember we said the Passover was one of those things. Even the Sabbath was one of those things. The tabernacle was one of those things. A lot of the, of the things that, that were revealed in the Old Testament in the life of, of the Jewish people in their relationship with God were shadows of things that were, were coming in, in greater fulfillment in the life of Jesus. So there's a whole story and a narrative that we must understand to get sometimes the true picture. And this is what we're going to try to do in relation to Revelation 20, because again, they're picking out a part of the narrative and, and, and then missing the whole storyline. Because if 
their interpretation is true and that is there's going to be a literal thousand year reign of Christ on earth then a lot of other pieces of the puzzle or of the narrative are going to fall apart if we focus on that literal reign it's going to create some other issues or other problems which we will we will examine as we look at it to see why it is necessary to get the whole picture and not try to interpret um the, the, the Bible in, in, in just little parts because you, you will miss the whole narrative or, or drama that is being revealed to us um, through the word. And Rev, we have um, either comment, question, or query from Randy. And someone is saying in the chat that Revelation 14 um, tells you who the 144,000 are, according to um, Dwayne Griffith. Yeah. So, Randy. Yes. Yes. Good night. Good night. Good night to you, brother Randy. Yes, sir. Now, Revelation chapter 20 begins, And I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the keys to the bottomless pit. Now, I, I would like to know, what does that bottomless pit signify? All right. All right, before I answer any, any questions, I, I would want, to hear other people um, indicate if there are things that they want to explain or questions that they have, and then we will read the whole chapter through. Because Revelation 20 itself is it, giving us a, a, like a, a little narrative here of, of, of its own that we must get the whole picture of what Revelation 20 is saying, or, or then we can misunderstand the chapter itself. Okay, based on what I was just trying to say to you, that sometimes we, we, we miss the full context because we don't get the full picture. And there's a picture being painted here in Revelation 20, which when we read it right through, we will get to understand and see the themes that are being developed and see what is connected to before. And I will explain certain things that we need to bear in mind when we are studying Revelation. So I will pause for a few more um, questions or queries or, or comments. And then we will read the, the full chapter through, and then we will attempt to go through it um, section by section and try to understand what it is saying, look for questions that are, are raised and answers that we must try to, to give based on the correct interpretation of, of this chapter. So just another minute for any other questions. So we, we hold that, Randy, as to what the interpretation here is. Reverend Jackman, um, we have yes. a message here um, that would have come in the chat earlier. Might have been based on mm -hmm. some discussion we would have touched on briefly on another occasion. So the query is, uh, so do we in the Church of God Reformation movement now discard Christmas services and celebrations? What is the general teaching now? Seems we are varied in our thinking. Your thoughts. But I can't, I can't say what it is general, the general teaching now because I introduced an idea based on my understanding of what the scripture was indicating as to how Christians should approach um, pagan cultures and pagan practices. Now, every, every element of what we do at Christmas may not necessarily be connected to paganism and there, and there are people who, who will say that what I am doing is not connected um, to paganism. And you have to give me the right to express how I feel about something um, and, and practice based on what I believe. Now, I indicated the danger with that is that, and I point out two, two illustrations. One, the Jews making a calf and indicating that the calf represented Yahweh. They believed that. And they stated that that, the, 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 that calf is a representation of, of, of their, their God. Why would they have done that? The reality is that they were influenced by pagan practices in Egypt, which would have come from Babylon, and they picked that up. And what they were basically saying is like, what the pagans did and used an image to represent their deity, they are doing the same thing and, and that is not going to go down well with God. 
So it, it, it wasn't a matter of what they thought they were doing or what they said they were doing. They were, would have been in disobedience to what God would stand for. Now, you would argue, well, the, 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 the commandments would not have been given as yet because Moses was coming back with them. But of, of course, that is the, the commandments that would have been written on the tablets of stone. But even before we had those, we had laws because Cain and Abel would have had laws and, and they had to be governed by law because then how, how would we know it was wrong for Abel um, to Cain to offer a different gift from Abel if they wasn't violating something? And, and, and then um, sin was laying at, at, the, at the heart of the person who would have killed the, the other so, so that we would have then be disobeying um, God's law. So the reality is that they would have had an understanding of, of what worship of God involves. So that's the first thing. It wasn't what they said. Then we had the experience of Saul allowing himself to be persuaded by the people to bring back sheep from the destruction of the Amalekites to offer as a sacrifice to God because they figured they were doing a good thing. But they were already told by God not to, to keep anything from the destruction of the Amalekites. So they were disobeying. So even though they might have a good intent, the fact is they were disobeying. So God's word have warned us time and time again and if you read again and you get a full narrative and it has mentioned a number of times do not allow yourselves to practice and do the things that the pagans do a lot of people believe that those were only referring to to the real vile things the offering children as a sacrifice or or making images um to deities and things like those but no any simple command that god gave if he says don't pick a fruit from off a tree you pick that fruit, it's disobedience. So it doesn't have to be a profound um, statement. If 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 Christ, of, if God says don't do something, then it must be obeyed. Again, remember the, the prophet that was given a specific command, and then another prophet came and gave him a different instruction. Uh, whereas she should have been going by the instruction that God gave him, he listened to somebody else, and he got punished. She got devoured by a wild animal. So which means then that we have to take instructions given by God seriously. We have to watch then where paganism lies in anything that we do and avoid it because that's what God warns us against. That's what we say. We look for things and I established that already before having to go back through the details where paganism lies in the whole um, Christmas celebration. One, the date for Christ's birth is based on error. So we cannot be celebrating an error. We can't be celebrating 25th of December as Christ's birth because it was not the date of Christ's birth and I showed you how it's connected to paganism and what was the origin of it. So it means that we should keep a distance from that. And then a lot of the other things that are involved in the practices and the traditions of Christmas came from pagan or or origin. It had nothing to do with the first century church that, that Jesus established. None of his apostles and disciples kept Christmas. None of them observed those festivities and traditions because it was not taught to them. And it was not established by Christ as an initial practice, and they never practiced it. The Christmas celebration came um, around the, the, the turn of the fourth century when Constantine tried to merge pagan practices with the Christian religion. The Christian adopted those things and they went along with them. And that's where it came in. So, what we have to establish is that we, we, we don't find ourselves being drawn a way to do one of those things. I explained the whole concept of the Christmas tree, how it was connected. So what we avoid is, 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 is following pagan traditions and doing things which are connecting us to paganism rather than connecting us to the worship of God. And we need not do these things to worship God. So that's, that's uh, my position on that. It will call for further dialogue and discussion, but you know that is what will, will have to take place um, among, among leaders and among us as people in terms of what we accept or what we don't accept in relation um, to what unfolds around the Christmas time. So, yeah, and Reverend, yeah. I, I think that you, you ended on a very good note there in relation to that, where um, more discussion and dialogue is necessary right. because um, like, like, okay, when, when, you look, when you look at it, um, when you really start to research it and so on, you realize that there are different schools of thought, um, not only to the birth, but how um, we arrive at December 25. Um, right. 
again, the, the feeling is, as you would have pointed out, it, it, it is not December 25. There are some who believe it's January 6th. And as was mentioned, I think sometime ago, sometime in October. But um, again, I think that what would be necessary before persons, to me, before persons run off and say, look, we, we are through with this. Um, look, look at it because... As you pointed out, and I'm in agreement, there are aspects that are, are solid and, and there are aspects for, for argument's sake. Um, when, when, when you're caught up with all the food and this and that, um, to me, that, that is not necessary. But long and short, we need more discussion, dialogue. Um, Sister Roseanne King, I believe she has... Uh, a comment might be in relation to this or query or question. So, um, Sister Rose. Yes, thank you, Reverend Chapman, Reverend Aline, and good night to everyone. I, good night I, to you. I have um, heard some of the discussion on this matter of Christmas. And here is my concern because I have seems as though some people are confused my my thinking on it is that if 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 we have a situation where um, traditionally this is what we have done this is christmas whether it is easter and uh, one from amongst us know through study or whatever or a, a, a greater revelation from the Lord um, passes on that enlightenment. Yes, we are the Church of God Reformation movement. What do we do? Because I don't think we can leave it like this. I think that as a movement, we should connect on common ground. And if we see sense um, and, and, and we ourselves, having heard, come to a greater awareness of what we should be doing or maybe some things we've been doing, they're pagan or whatever. Where do we go from here? Because as things filter through the, the, the system, um, people speak to each other, people have friends and all across the, 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 the churches. Um, how how do we how do we get on common ground or do we not have to be on common ground um if 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 reverend jackman is enlightened if he knows that he knows if 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 it has been revealed to him he has done his research whatever and he decides on his location look this is what this is what i'm gonna i'm gonna teach my people or i'm gonna um, widen the net for those who who want um, that enlightenment, that awareness to come to their location. Then it comes to them. My question is, uh, my concern is, how do we as a movement connect on common ground and speak and speak with one voice, or do we not need to speak? with one voice on this, that there, there's no problem. That's my, that's my concern. All right, Sister Rosa, I respond to that. That's a, that's a very good concern. That's a very important concern as to how we, we deal with, with any variation in terms of our theological perspectives and understanding, because that's what we're, we're, we're dealing with, theological perspective at the end times. I'm not, I'm not even certain that all of us might agree with all the perspectives in relation to the end times, but these are things that we need to discuss. And yes, there have been traditions that have been established in church in terms of how we view Easter, how we think about it, and, and the terms we use on, on, on Christmas, but all it calls for is, is dialogue. People coming together, and I have suggested this. I, they, 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 they are people who know my position on, on, on these things, and, and it is not to cause any schism because we're not about that. We are about working together and harmonizing our understanding. Now, really and truly, I, I have to defend the word as a, as, a, as a teacher, as a preacher of the word. I have to defend the word and not tradition and not even the beliefs 
of a, of a, of a, um, of a denomination that I might be part of. It has to be based on the word. If I can see from it, understand the word that this is the position, I, then I think that I should defend that. What, what we do is to try to, to come together, discuss it, and see what we can accept and what we need to, to, um, to move away from as a general understanding of, of what we can agree to disagree on and, 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 and still maintain the, the, the sort of connection and spirit that we have. But what we have to agree on is what we believe the word is saying. At the end of the day, the agreement has to be what the word is indicating to us and how we, we should proceed based on that. But I have, I have welcomed that. I have suggested um, that, that dialogue in relation to Christmas, in relation to Easter, in relation to crucifixion. And I, I, have, I have not uh, received an audience um, in relation to that. So that, that is where that is. But you are right. These are things that we, we, we should talk about as leaders and get an understanding of. Because there are other things that, that sometimes we have a variance on, like in terms of marriage and divorce and, 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 and things like, like um, how people function in the church and, and, and human sexuality. Because even churches are divided on, on that now, whether people who are gay are Christians and should function in the church. See, all those are things that, 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 that you need to dialogue on and, and based on what the word is saying and not what we feel about it or not what tradition but have established. So that is what, how we believe we should, we should approach that. Um, so that's my response on that. So we read, we read Revelation that at least we can get a general understanding of it and, and see how much excitement this is going to create and how much we need to understand in relation to this because it's a very, very important um, theological perspective and we must get the truth of it. So I want to read it right through and then we can start because we still have about 14 minutes to, to dialogue on it. But as I indicated, this is another one of those chapters that will carry us into at least two sessions to get it um, clearly understood. So we are, we, are, we are coming down very well and we are getting some of the heavy topics um, started out. And then after this one, though, we got to deal with the Battle of Armageddon. That's another issue. Um, but we will, we will get some enlightenment on, on Revelation 20. So I read. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. You've got to ask yourself first, are those literal terms or are those figurative terms? And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. So this is the archangel, the devil who was Lucifer, the prince of, of, of light and morning glory, he's now called the dragon with serpent. So are we, we dealing with literal terms here or figurative representations? That's the first thing that we have to, to, to settle. What is the type of language used? What is the genre? Because we said that that is one of the principles that we have to apply when we are interpreting the word. Look at the, look at the genre. Is it figurative language or, or is it straight direct language? Is it symbolic? And he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loose a little season. And I saw thrones and they sat upon them and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither has rec received his mark upon their forehead or in their hands. And we, we, we had reference of that earlier up in relation to the beast. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. Turn mention there again. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, 
to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beasts and the false prophets are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books, according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Now that's the whole chapter. Now you're going to see in that chapter, but first of all, we have to establish the language. There is a lot of figurative language used in that whole chapter. And that's the first thing that we have to understand. It means then that it, it, it lends itself to a lot of interpretation and, and the language has to be understood that it's being used and whether it's to be literally taken as read or if it's to be interpreted because it is symbolic language. Now we have from the very beginning of the book established that John was given the revelation and it was signified to him which means that it was given in symbols. So it's symbolic language right throughout the book. The, 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 the part of it is language that has to be interpreted. Now, if you look at Revelation holistically, you will see that there are a number of themes, sorry, Revelation 20, there are a number of themes developed in this one chapter here, you know. You have, first of all, a first resurrection mentioned which implies that it has to be a second resurrection. It's not mentioned. The first resurrection is mentioned. But if you have first, the implication is that you have to have a second because you're using a, a, a numerical value here. So first implies that there's a second. Then you have a mention of a second death, but not a first death. Watch that carefully. Which means then that the implication is that if there's a second death, there is there has to be a first death. So we now have to understand is there a, a figurative interpretation of a first and a second resurrection as well as a literal one? Is there a figurative interpretation of a first death as well as a literal one? That is what has to be understood. When we get into the details, we see yes, there is a figurative expression of the first resurrection, and we have a lot of passages in the New Testament which symbolizes that. And we will look at those. So the second resurrection could be referring to a physical resurrection. That's when Christ comes back and the dead in Christ are resurrected. But as a matter of fact, all the dead, because as you go down Revelation, you will see that there is a, is a general resurrection. The sea gave up all the dead. So we know there's a physical resurrection and there's a spiritual re resurrection. Then we say that those who are part of the first resurrection, the second death does not have any hold on them. What is the second death? What does that mean? Is the second death a physical separation from God in eternity? So then what would be the first death? Could that be a spiritual death where you are separated from God spiritually as we once were without Christ? Those are things that we have to understand. And I, I think there is um, a clear indication that we have both a physical and a spiritual resurrection mentioned here. We have a, a spiritual death and a physical death. And those we have to understand. We see a binding of Satan mentioned in the text. What does that mean? Is it a literal binding of Satan? Or is this a, a spiritual 
binding of Satan? Does it mean uh, some sort of controlled or restraint is put on Satan? And you've got to ask yourself, when is that restraint placed on him? When is it taking place? Um, see, I'm, I'm putting up questions that we have to answer, that you know what we're going to be dealing with when we, when we, when we go into the, the nitty-gritty, as we would say, of, of, of this, uh, this chapter, when we, when we get down to the, to the fine point of it. We, we see a judgment given on, on Satan. We see that he has a, 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 a time of restriction, but we also see an expression of a judgment on Satan and the false prophet and the Antichrist, as, as, as is illustrated. Okay, we, we see people reigning with Christ. So is this a, a, a physical reigning on the earth or is this a spiritual reigning? So the indication of what we're dealing with here, because the language is very symbolic, it's very figurative, you have to recognize that there are spiritual applications to some of the things mentioned in Revelation. And what the premillennialists are saying is no, you have to take the Bible literally. And therefore, the amillennialists are spiritualizing things and they are moving people away from the truth. I do not think that that is the case. Because if you, if you have... Uh, overall literal interpretation of the Bible itself then you run yourself into a whole lot of misinterpretations because a lot of the Bible has figurative language which we will come to see must be interpreted in the light that it, 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 um, it has to be. So this is where we look back at prophecies now like Isaiah 35, Isaiah 65, Isaiah 61 Isaiah 12, a whole lot of passages in Isaiah and Jeremiah and some of the other um, prophets, which the premillennialists use to support the theology of millennium, that is what we have to get to understand. Are those prophets speaking of a literal um, period of, of reign in the future where these things are yet to happen? Or were they speaking of things in a figurative way that were to come to pass during the, the, the advent of Christ and the establishment of the kingdom? See, this is where the connection of the whole understanding of the kingdom has to be related. So these are things that will engage us. So I'm giving you an overview so that you, you know what we have to resolve to get the answer to how we interpret Revelation. Uh, Rev? Um, at you. Yes. We have Pastor John here. Um, yes. I believe either query, comment, or question. So Pastor John? Uh, good night, Brother Chapman. Yes, sir. Um, Brother Eddie, I think one of the things that we need to set as a basis is that for the interpretation, all we need really to do is to keep the vision in the vision. What? It's the key. Vision, the vision, the material yes. in the vision. If we yes. try to bring into the literal interpretation, into the work, into the, the, the revelation itself, we're going to have trouble. Yeah. Because what John is saying here is that I draw, saw an angel come down from heaven. John is yeah. talking about the vision he's having. And so that everything that is said here must be in, understood that this is the vision that John is having. Yes. Can, can we then think that it can be literal if he's having a vision? All right. If he's expecting the vision yes. towards the vision he's seeing, can we then think that it is literal? I don't think I don't think we can, but I'm saying that so that we remember that the basis of, of our interpretation, we always need to keep the material for the vision in the vision. We can't, we can't transport it or we can't translate it over the vision. The vision material is vision material. However, if you can think about interpreting, you need to remember, remember the historical, grammatical context in which it is written. All right. Good point. Good point. Right. He's, he's having a vision. But of course, because the, but of course, in, in that vision, there are certain themes that are expressed. There are certain um, phrases that are expressed in relation to what he is seeing in the vision. Now, the, now the vision is revealing something that is very, very significant. We must understand that. Because the, the, the vision, if we go back from the very beginning, is it, it, set to give Christians an understanding of something from the mind of God. So, 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 yes, he's seeing a vision. He's seeing these things. They're, they're not actually happening. He's seeing a vision, but 
that vision is sending a message to us as believers. It is saying something to us that we, we need to come to, to grips with. And there, there, there's an overall message in all of this. We see Satan get defeated and the church is triumphant in the end. That's, that's the overall message that we have to see. The church was opposed from Revelation chapter 12. Now, we've we got to see parallels. Because remember, I told you, we have to understand Revelation is a book written with recapitulations. In other words, one team is developed early up and it is expanded on later down. Or you're given a different perspective on it. It's, it's just like you have instant replays now in sports. When they're trying to make a decision, they replay things that, that took place from a different angle they give you a different perspective on it. And this is what is happening here in John. We are getting things from a different angle and from a different perspective, but it's a recapitulation, recapitulation or a repeat of a theme that was uh, mentioned earlier up. Because you will notice that when you look back at Revelation 16, you will see some of these, Revelation 6, sorry, the same mention of the souls that were beheaded for the sake of the gospel, etc. So again, take that into consideration that there is a repeat and we have to see what might be repeated here. There are themes that are mentioned. There, are, there is um, specific theology that comes out, even in the vision, and we have to understand what that theology is. And it has to match back with, a, with, with the overall perspective. Why isn't there any mention in the New Testament of a thousand year reign? Why in all the Old Testament passages that the premillennialists use, which we will look at as I indicated, to suggest that they're speaking of a millennium, the word is never even mentioned. It's not even hinted, uh, excuse me, about a thousand years. That is also what we have to consider. So we will look back at New Testament passages and see if there's any indication from what they're suggesting of a millennium because they're saying, yes, we can find some. And we will look at some of those. What they're saying is, is that a lot of those Old Testament passages that we predict relate to the coming of Christ and his kingdom are actually referring to the millennial kingdom or the literal kingdom that is to be set up. We're going to look at issues because what happens after the resurrection? What, what happens to, to us as, as people? Are we changed? Can we, can we live on earth? and still go on with a normal life with people having children and giving births in resurrected bodies. All those are things that we have to look at in terms of the whole picture. Return to a temple worship. When Christ abolished that, and when the temple was destroyed in AD 70, he, he, he wiped out basically all these things that were just shadows. So we're going back to shadows again of offering sacrifices in a temple. And that Jesus says that his kingdom is not of this world. And, and we are going back to fighting. And battling at Armageddon, and we are going back to, to to sin in a millennium. Because if people are going to be saved in a millennium, what are they being saved from? So all of these are things that we have to, to fit, as as I said, into a whole narrative. And and the Bible does not contradict itself; it does not confuse itself. It is very very clear. And if it can't match back to the overall picture, then we have to adjust our theological perspective. So we will look at our position and see if it can hold steady in relation to the truth of the word and we can defend it and stand by it or if we need to make adjustments. We will look at the preliminary view and see if their position can hold um, to, the, to the overall context of, of, of the word or if they are the ones that should have to make an adjustment to how they interpret that. So there's a lot of, of um, understanding that has to come. It's a very deep passage, but it can be made very, very clear as we examine the scripture. And that is what is the exciting time that we're going to have coming to us in the next week. So read it up. Check your, your um, references and, and, and come armed with information that can help support a particular position. And to answer Randy's question without going into details, the first part of this chapter here has to be symbolic. Because are you dealing with a literal key? And the Bible mentions key as a symbol of authority before. Jesus says, give us the keys 
to the kingdom? Are we given a literal key? Are you going to put a chain around a spirit and bind him? And if a, a pit doesn't have a bottom, how are you putting him in a bottomless pit? And again, are the expressions here meant to be taken literal? And if the key is symbolic and the pit is symbolic and, and, the, and the, um, the binding of, of the of devil with the chain is symbolic, then you've got to ask yourself the question. If, if all these things are symbolic, what about the sentence? He's, he's there for a thousand years. So isn't that then symbolic as well? Doesn't that represent something other than a literal thousand year period? Because if all the other things are symbolic and, they, and the preeminence do accept that there's a lot of symbolism in here, then why don't you carry it right through in terms of the description given? So those are the things that will engage our minds next week. Please don't miss it. This is a, this is a very critical passage in our understanding of future events. And I want you to, to get a good, clear understanding of it and that you yourself are in a position, if you are questioned as to your understanding, that you can give a good exposition based on, on what the, the scripture reveals to us. So we're going right. to pause there. Yes. Just before you close out, uh, we have mm -hmm. Ian again with either a comment, a query, or a question. Um, yeah. So, Brother Ian? Yes, Brother Ian. Yes, Reverend Jackman. Earlier tonight, you mentioned your study buddy. Uh, I wonder if you would be willing to share with us like some of the Bible commentators that you use and then some of the sources of your research um, that we can refer to in our own research when we're checking stuff during the course of the week. If you don't have to do it now, but next week. Yeah, but I, 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 yeah I, had given, I had given a listing earlier, which mm -hmm. I, I said when we, when we perhaps come to the end of the study, I will, I will give um, overall. But you, okay. you, you can you can check you can check people like Doctor Doctor Sam Storms. That's S A M S E R R M S, and and these and these are are um, series that are done on YouTube. You just type in the name, and these people have done a whole lot of series, uh, a lot of information you get. So, Doctor Sam Waldron, Doctor Vodi Bocum, that is V. W O D I E B O U C H A M. And then you have Ken, Ken Gentry or Kenneth. Kenneth would be the full name. Kenneth Gentry, G N T R Y. Okay. Right. So, so those are some. That, that you can check. And as I said, some of these were once pre-millennialists, like Dr. Sam Storms and Dr. Vody Bocum. They were once pre-millennialists and they have changed when they, as I said, when they got a good understanding and they came out of seminary and they did their own personal studies, they say they could no longer support the pre-millennial view because it does not match with, with, with what the Bible is teaching. So, so it's important to check those persons because they, they change their position based on their own personal study and not what they were taught in, um, in, in Bible school. Yes, so I will, I, will add a, I, will add a few, I will add a few more um, to the list as I, as, I, as I go on. Thank you, sir. Yes. Um, 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 by the way, my, my study buddy is not one of these big theologians, right? My study buddy, as I indicated, is Brother Delvin uh, McAllister. If you are not familiar with him, he's Pastor Richard's brother. Uh, but we, we, go, we go way back as young Christians come together studying um, and discussing and, and researching um, together. As I said, there was a little break, but now we are reconnected. So that, that's my study buddy. So don't think that I'm referring to um, one of these big theologians. But as I said, he's not trained in seminary, but he's very, very knowledgeable. And we really engage each other well. All right, so that's it from, from me tonight. And, and please don't don't miss next week's session. It's going, it's going to be pretty interesting as we seek to understand Revelation 20 and, and clarify a whole lot of things that 
very often has been misunderstood and, and misinterpreted. Um, and we hope to get a better understanding of it um, from our position as we look also at other um, perspectives on it. So God bless you and have a good night.